Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, Simple History's got a new video out and it's about tanks, but not just that. This video is titled Useless Overweight Tanks of World War II. All right, we know the tank game was strong in the war. Let's see which one sucked. All right, make sure you watch the original video. It's linked down below. Let's get started. I'm ready. Absolute unit tanks. <laughs> Bigger is Absolute better, unit. or so the saying goes. And some tank designers took this to what heart. Europeans as call tanks played an athletes, increasingly vital role athletes. on the battlefield. Absolute some units. would be designed with speed or durability in mind. Some, however, did away with any subtlety and can only be described as absolute units. <laughs> the Jagdtiga. As the Second World the War dragged on, on, German forces found themselves on the defensive, facing down heavy tanks such as the Soviet KV-1. German leadership looked for new ways to combat the growing threat of Allied armor. They were eager to place the massive 128 mm Pac-44 anti-tank gun a onto tank. a mobile platform. In 1942, <laughs> literally just go began boom. on a vehicle from mounting such a large main gun. After success using the Panther hull for a tank destroyer, the Jagd Panther, the same would be done with the hull of the King Tiger. After testing, production began in 1944. Known as the Jagdtiga, or Hunting Tiger, the vehicle was originally classified as an assault gun, but due to bickering within the German military, it would eventually be classified as a Panzerjäger, or as a, as tank destroyer. Unit. The Jagdtiga was the largest tracked vehicle to participate in the Second World War. Weighing in at a colossal 71 metric tons, it featured frontal casemate armor, almost 10 inches thick, much more than the tanks it was designed to hunt, and all but impervious to Allied tanks. While formidable What's the downside, paper, in reality, the Jagdtiga's performance was underwhelming. <laughs> the biggest issue was the engine, the same type used in the Tiger II, an already woefully oh, underpowered yeah, engine that, for a vehicle nah, that weighed just big. under 70 well, metric tons. Like Breakdowns were common as it struggled to propel the behemoth, and more were lost in this way than in enemy oh, action, gosh. forcing crews to abandon the vehicles. Production of the Agtiga was complex and difficult to build. Just got and roasted of the inside of it. ordered, only around half were made. Today, only three survive intact. One each in the United States, Russia, and Great Britain. Dude. All museum pieces. They're cool looking though. Okay, that thing is cool looking though. I gotta. You, you, sometimes you just gotta look good on the battlefield. You know what I mean? Um, hey, I was gonna interject and say that you know World War II was still an experimental time for tanks. You know, they made their appearance in World War One. If you know about World War One tanks, they were terrible, right? It was automobile technology itself was brand new, let alone try to do mechanized warfare. Those things sucked. And with, um, you know, countries, you know, in the interwar years having to reallocate, you know, money and, and stuff like that away from um, military research, unless you're, you know, Hitler and uh, going against the Treaty of Versailles and researching this stuff anyways, um, there wasn't as much development, right? So World War II was still, I think, a very experimental time. I think it's now that, like, tanks have really been figured out in a, in a lot of ways. But now it's kind of interesting because, you know, are, are tanks even becoming obsolete? Because now it's about drones and that kind of precision stuff. So that's actually an interesting question. What's the, what do you think the history of or the, the future of tanks hold? United States, Russia, and Great Britain, it's all cool. museum pieces. Look at that thing. Ever dreamed of ruling the world? Too bad real life doesn't work that way. I don't know what Professor Broman is. Totally on does. Twitch. Command secret weapons he always like reminds tanks, me of planes, him. and even <laughs> the dreaded rubber duck of doom. Just kidding, it's a nuclear bomb. Declare war on your neighbors, or don't. Who am I to tell you how to run your imaginary empire? And the best part? You can do it. We'll get to his coupon code. And because. Want to support that? Get yourself some gold. Which game is this? Call of freebies. War, because World unlike War II. my New Year's resolution, this offer won't last more than 30 days. Oh, I like his uh, sign, keep calm and study history. That's sick. Cool. All the right. GW Tiger P. Okay. The Jagdtiger wasn't the only heavy vehicle planned by the Wehrmacht. Once again, using the Tiger chassis as the basis, a vehicle was designed Just to imagine like, rain. you know, like in World War II, they had like 1v1 tank battles. It sounds like it'd be a you know, like a video game, go out and they're just like approaching the streets and all of a sudden they're just like, you know, and then like you win. It's just like, it's, a, it's like, I don't know, it's wild. It's wild. Artillery you pieces. Know? The Geschutzwagen Tiger or GW Tiger P was a planned self-propelled howitzer of massive proportions whose initial concept dates back shooting. as far as 1942. 
Though incomplete, it tipped the scales at an impressive 58 metric tons without any cannon or other mounted weaponry, and with thin armor <laughs> of a little over an inch thick. As a howitzer, kind of heavy stylish, armor dude. would be unnecessary. Mm -hmm. What made the Geschützwagen Tiga more impressive was the length, the which could vary between a lengthy 36 feet up to an astounding 43 feet, depending on the planned variant. Oh For comparison, a Tiger I <coughs> was just under 28 feet in length, Change including plus. the main gun. The GW Tiger P was a modular design and could have carried two different artillery pieces, either a 170mm cannon or a 210mm mortar. Both were standalone artillery pieces already in use by the Wehrmacht. There were also potential plans for a 305mm mortar version. The Geschützwagen Tiger never saw combat, as the first prototype was incomplete when it was captured in 1945 <laughs> by Allied forces. War is over. The Still the war ended. M Tush. Hungary okay, was so that one was kind of neat. They didn't, they didn't go into as much detail about it, but it was never even used in combat. At least the other ones were attempted, right? So, like, this thing was like, this is the thing you bring up in the rear, you know, because it's long-distance shooting, and then you bring up your other artillery with it. So, you know, got to bring up the rear. Okay. Never saw combat. That? As the so those both were was German, right? So, I mean, when it was captured German. in 1945 by Allied forces. I want to see some weird Allied M ones. Hungary was suffering heavy casualties at the hands of the Soviet Union, Hungarian? and by 1943 it was clear that the tanks employed by the Hungarian armed forces Never hear were woefully Hungarian. inadequate against the Soviet T-34s okay. and KV-1s. A new tank was needed in order to match these highly effective adversaries on the battlefield. <laughs> The Hungarian military at first sought manufacturing rights from Germany to produce Panzer IV pretty, and V tanks, standard but Germany refused. Looking tank, looking As a result, in August 1943, Hungarian engineers set to work creating a new tank from scratch that could compete on the modern battlefield. The outcome of this planning was the 44M Tush, inspired by the German Panther tank. Just, Two yeah, prototypes just looks like were made, one made out of mild German steel, ones. and What's a so-called finalized version with full armor plated superstructure. The 44M Tush was more thickly armored than its Panther counterpart, with frontal hull armor plating 120 millimeters or just under 5 inches thick, compared to the okay. Panther 1's 80 millimeters or 3.1 inches. The turret of the Tush was a blocky, octagonal structure that was intended to contain a large 80 millimeter L58 anti-aircraft gun, modified for use on the tank. When this proved anti-aircraft guns with tanks seemed like that would be so. It'd be. I feel like. You know, obviously, I, I, I wasn't in the military or anything, but uh, um, it would be very difficult to 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 use and like to aim. Can anyone uh, help me out with that? Like, you know, you have your your standard surface to air artillery and and and, and weaponry, but like for a tank to be able to hit moving targets like that with how you know slow they operate, is that why this thing didn't work as well? Feasible, the main yeah, armament was switched to the forty three M seventy five millimeter L forty three cannon. Though the Tosh has a very blocky and intimidating silhouette, it only weighed in at 38 metric tons, which in most militaries would classify it as a medium tank. Due to a quirk in the Hungarian military's classification system, any tank, regardless of size, that carried a main gun 75 millimeters or larger would be classified as a heavy tank. While engineering yeah. issues with the Tosh were being right. ironed out, there were also plans for the Tosh Rohamlovig, a mobile assault gun. Details are sparse, but apparently the Roham Lovig was based scary. on the Jagd Panther assault gun, and it was rumored to have a lower profile and sleeker appearance than its German counterpart. Okay, I like that. And potentially it could have been equipped with a massive 88mm main gun, which would have been capable of ripping through Allied armor with impunity. The factory where the Tosh prototypes were being developed was hit by an Allied bombing raid in 1944, destroying everything. Before any development Allies could resume, the Soviet forces had advanced into Hungary, and the 44M Tosh was never completed, Too and late. the Roham Lovig never left the drawing board. I'm and noticing um, the, the the thing with all these tanks they've shown thus far is that they came late in the war, right? War is all about seeing what's going on now, like, you know, how are things fighting now, and then trying to build the next advantage to that. Like, we see that World War One, we see it in World War Two, so it's just like bigger tanks right so you're getting bigger ones but yeah by the end of it um there was no time left ending a stuff needed to happen five years earlier development the tog 2 by the time of the second world war tanks had undergone significant development yeah the mobile nature of the conflict but this one looks 
tank development. What's this the tug. This looks a lot more World War One like. This this looks a lot. Look at World War One tanks. This looks a lot more like that. But again, they were uh, not real good in to incorporate into like uh, attack, you know, formations and things like that. They were slow and etc. Um, Two. You know. By the time of the Second World War, tanks had undergone significant development. The mobile nature of the conflict required tanks that could move rapidly, yeah. using yeah, speed to their advantage. There were some, however, who Big still sauna. envisioned tank formations in their original role, breaking right. through the trench lines of the First World War. Yeah. So the, the, the original design, or the original yeah, design purpose, I should say, of tanks, if you didn't know, was to get through no man's land. It was for, for trench warfare. Um, it was to be able to get out. And yeah, yeah, I know you're still going slow, but at least we could be arbored enough to uh, get through no man's land, um, break down the uh, the barbed wire nests, right? Those were horrible. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would crush those. And that was the big one, uh, the big use of them. Yes, they had guns and stuff. Like we said, they were slow and, you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, that was their original use. Now they're much more offensive in World War II. In 1939, with this in mind, Britain's Special Vehicle Development Committee designed a super heavy tank intended for trench warfare. Two prototypes were tested, both named TOG, a reference to the nickname given to the people who had worked on tanks during the previous conflict, the Old Gang. But the TOG-1 was soon scrapped. The TOG-2, however, came to life as a behemoth of a vehicle. The 33-foot-long TOG-2 tipped the scales, literally. Only half of the vehicle could be weighed at a time, totaling 81 metric tons. Train, basically Due to train. its colossal size, the 600-horsepower engine propelled the tank at a top speed of only 8.5 miles per hour. Armament was a 17-pounder cannon and a single 7.92-millimeter BASA machine gun. Protection came in the form of about 3 inches of armor plating. The boxy design and large frame would have made the TOG-2 an easy target for the enemy, and the nearly vertical armor would have made it vulnerable yeah, to but I don't tank be weaponry. Near it. The TOG-2 was outdated from the beginning, yeah, designed looked, for a war that was long over. Looked like a world Testing war ran war from time. 1941 to 1943. However, it was apparent that such a tank was no longer needed and the project was halted. The TOG-2 avoided the fate of its counterpart, remaining intact and is on display at the Tank Museum in Bovington, Great Britain, and is the heaviest vehicle in their collection. A-39 Tortoise. Okay. The TOG-2 wasn't the only so giant got tank. So we got German tanks, we had Hungary, Hungarian, uh, British, and now... On the drawing board, in 1943, expecting to face heavy German defenses such as the Siegfried Line, British planners ordered the development the of a specialized assault vehicle designed to breach enemy fortifications, it's more like the first no one. matter how extensive they were. After some debate, one design out of 18 proposals was selected. 25 vehicles were ordered, and it was hoped that they would be ready for the battlefield by September 1945. Eventually, the order was reduced to six. Designated the A-39-5 vehicles were ordered, and it was hoped that they would be ready for the battlefield by September 1945. <laughs> the problem with that, the war was over in Europe uh, five months before that. <laughs> Eventually, April, the order May, was reduced to six. Designated the A-39 Tortoise, the gargantuan vehicle lived up to its name. Looks foregoing wide. mobility in favor of protection, the majority of the tortoise's 79 metric tons Good was for urban plating, warfare. almost nine inches thick in some places, and able to shrug off virtually anything that could be thrown at it. Yeah, good As it for was urban designed to break through the heavy defenses, the tortoise yeah. can also dish out impressive punishment as well, the main gun being a huge 32-pounder cannon. As expected from such a titanic vehicle, the tortoise's greatest weakness was mobility. Its 600 horsepower engine could only move it at a top speed of 12 miles per hour. So all of these, I mean, it's, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't use, you couldn't use these. It just, it, <coughs> it couldn't be the only thing that you're going in with. Like it has to be part of a larger unit that has, you know, more mobility and stuff like that. You know? And was another issue. It required two heavy haulage trucks to move from place to place and could not cross any mobile bridge in the British arsenal without the structure breaking. By the time the tortoise was ready for use, however, the war was over, ending the project. Of the six vehicles made, four were scrapped. Two still Melted remain, down, like one at Kirkubri, Scotland. The other resides at the Bovington Tank Museum, where it remains in working order, the second heaviest yeah, vehicle working. in the collection. 
After World Some drunk War guys II, the idea it. of heavy tanks faded, as military planners adopted the idea of multi-role main battle tanks, leaving these absolute units relics of the past. To the absolute units. All right, thanks for joining me on this. Uh, this was more about me learning about them. Um, there's a lot I have to learn about, like the real specifics of models and things in you know military history. And I know a lot of you probably watch this are like really into that. You know, it's like very much a, like a, a a sub like a subgroup within kind of the history community is you know, like the military tech people. And I haven't really been around that as much. And I know you know the general stuff. So like this kind of stuff helps me you know learn and and y'all can teach me right. So I asked a few questions you know throughout it about some of the usage and stuff. Um, so make sure to to let me know. Now I did have I wanted to bring back a question. I ended or I. I had earlier in the video, which was, what do you think is the future for tanks uh, when it comes to warfare? I was talking about how uh, we have these precision airstrikes and drones and stuff now. Which is, you know, already kind of changing warfare and becoming less involved with on ground personnel. So what do you think is the role for that? And if they are going to continue, is it going to be more of the the light mobile type? Could there be a scenario where the the large hulking ones like that can come back? I don't know. What do you think? All right. With that, y'all, we'll see you next time.